Hi, welcome back to Bedtime Stories with OHA. I'm Greg Tripoli from the Onondaga Historical Association. And uh, the story that I'm going to tell you today, actually it's two stories, two of my favorite stories uh, from our local history that are combined because they're intertwined. Uh, again, from my favorite period in history, the turn of the last century. You know, at the time there was so much venture capital, so many entrepreneurs here, people who were worth investing in and people who had the money to invest in them. And um, one of the people I'm going to tell you about today, Sam Schubert, was one of those people. At the time, uh, Syracuse was a very important stop on the theater circuit in America, both for a uh, tryout city, for shows that were headed to New York City, and also for shows that were fresh from New York City that were going on tour. So theater was big. There were three main theaters in town at the time. Uh, the Weeding, the Grand, and the Bastable, and they're all located right in the center of time, uh, uh, center of town. So the story that I want to tell you today is about two people, Sam Schubert and Edna May, who helped each other achieve really the pinnacle, the top in the theater industry at the time. Now, Sam was a couple years older than Edna May, uh, even though they both started in theater around the same time. So I'm going to start with Sam. He was born around 1876. Uh, his family here in Syracuse, dirt poor, uh, you know, just uh, really poverty stricken. His father was an abusive, alcoholic, religious fanatic who, when the boys were around eight or nine years old, he kicked them out of the house uh, and they began the role that they would play for a lifetime, which is really the breadwinners for the family. Now, Sam Schubert, who was the middle brother, he started contributing his fair shares to the family coffers by selling newspapers and candy and shining shoes in front of those three local theaters. Um, the manager of the Grand Theater, a guy named Charles Plummer, uh, noticed Sam, and he noticed that this kid had just a really infectious personality, very charismatic. People loved him. Uh, he was always moving, never ran or never walked, uh, always ran. And so he hired Sam to be a program boy. And Sam then worked his way up through the theaters in, uh, in Syracuse through box office and eventually uh, treasurer. Uh, he brought his brothers, his older brother Lee and his younger brother JJ into the business. And um, uh, by the time, you know, he was in his mid-teens, he was the, uh, the treasurer of the Weeding Theater here in Syracuse. Um, that was around 1894, five. And that was about the same time that Edna May, in fact, Sam Schubert was the treasurer of the Weeding when Edna May made her professional debut here in Syracuse at the Weeding in 1895. Um, Edna May began her career here in Syracuse on the stage. She had her first role when she was five, um, and she continued to hone her craft here. Uh, and soon, you know, by the time she was in her mid-teens, she was starring in the top shows back-to-back -back here in the, in the local three theaters. She was born uh, with exceptional beauty and a fine singing voice and honed her acting skills here, but she really, uh, by 1895, she had really achieved pretty much all that she could here in Syracuse. She wanted to improve her skills and, and uh, study dramatic arts and music, um, but that really meant at that time moving to New York City. And her father was a letter car carrier, did not have the sort of funds that would allow for that. Luckily enough, uh, Edna May's uncle came into a uh, a pretty sizable fortune around this time, and he agreed to finance Edna's education. So in the spring of 1895, Edna heads to New York and enrolls in the National Conservatory of Music. Now, her roommate at school is a, an aspiring actress named Sylvia Thorne, but her real last name is Titus, and she's the sister of a guy named Fred Titus. Uh, Fred Titus was a bicycle racer, but a really famous bicycle racer. In the days before automobile racing, bicycle racers were really sort of the superstar athletes, and none was bigger than Fred Titus. He was a notorious womanizer, and uh, so, of course, he began to um, actively court Edna May. Uh, Edna May soon fell victim to his charms, and despite the chagrin of her parents, uh, she and uh, uh, Fred were married in 18, early 1896, I think. Uh, he was 20, she was only 17. Uh, it didn't take long for Fred to return to his womanizing ways, so Edna actually left him uh, within about a year. But the divorce never became actually final until 1905 because Fred fought that all the way through. 
But regardless, Edna didn't let her personal troubles get in the way of her Broadway dreams. And um, by 1896, I think, uh, you know, some in the spring of 1896, fall of 1896, she had her Broadway debut in a production that was produced by Oscar Hammerstein, uh, Oscar Hammerstein Sr. Uh, so uh, this is 1896, and around this time, Sam uh, Schubert and his brothers are uh, building their little theatrical empire. It's announced in 1896 that Sam will be the new manager of the Bastable Theater in Syracuse. Now, this is the first theater of the Schuberts that they manage or own that is the first in a string that will be unmatched in their career. Uh, bringing his brothers in, they, uh, they begin to um, uh, also manage the other theaters in town. And uh, they take investment from their neighborhood, literally from their Jewish 15th Ward neighborhood. Uh, investors invest in the Schubert brothers and help them um, uh, build this theatrical empire. Not only money, but the management people, the artistic expertise, the lawyers, the uh, advertising, all came from Syracuse and mostly from that neighborhood of the 15th Ward. The Schuberts uh, brought outside investors in to build, uh, fuel a rapid expansion, and they had to pay um, a return to uh, to those folks too. So um, Sam is uh, now has managing his own theater. It's also announced in 1896 that Sam will be a tour producer for the first time. As a very precocious 18-year-old, he goes to this guy named Charles Hoyt, who is one of the top theater um, uh uh, author is one of the top playwrights in the country at the time, and he wins the ability to uh, produce an East Coast tour of Hoyt's play called A Texas Steer. Uh, so Sam is well on his way building uh, theater and, and producing credits. Now, in 1897, on, in January of 1897, Edna May opens uh, Hoyt's new play on Broadway called A Contented Woman, and she's the star of the show. Now, the show is a mediocre hit, but Edna is, gets rave reviews in all of the newspapers, and she becomes the new it girl of Broadway. She doesn't really hit big-time stardom until later on in that year, 1897, when she appears on Broadway in the title role of Violet Gray in George Letterer's production of The Bell of New York. That's when uh, uh, Edna really hits it big time. She... Um, she takes the, the show on tour, and uh, it plays in the Schubert's uh, theaters in upstate New York. Now, at the time, there was a syndicate, a monopoly, that controlled American theater from coast to coast. The Schubert's were fighting against the syndicate because they felt that producers and theater owners should be able to put in their theaters what their public wanted. And the Schubert's always kept their ear to the ground. They knew what the public wanted, and they gave it to them. So the Schubert's were kind of fighting against the syndicate. George Letterer was also fighting against the syndicate, and he had had enough of their tactics. So he took uh, the Bell of New York and Edna, out of the U.S. and took it to London, where it became the runaway hit. And Edna becomes the toast of two coasts. She is the queen of theater. Uh, the show runs for like solidly for two years. Um, and Edna becomes literally the biggest star uh, in the world. The, the Post Standard in 1897 ran an article in January that listed just some of the gifts that Edna had received from her admirers. I mean, forget the flowers. Men threw everything from property deeds to jewelry at her feet during her many curtain calls. And despite the fact that she was still technically a married woman, the list in the post standard of the jewels that she received is amazing. We're talking uh, uh, ruby and diamond bracelets and sapphire and diamond bracelets and five diamond rings and pearl necklaces and uh, uh, brooches and pins encrusted with jewels. But these were mere baubles compared to some of the jewels that Edna acquired during her superstar reign. At one point, a Portuguese count gave her uh, an eight-strand strand pearl kind of dog collar necklace with a uh, Art Deco diamond uh, uh, clasp. And, and, and this really set a fashion trend. And, and though she never really revealed the source, although everyone assumed that it was the very, very rich Henry Cavendish, who was the Earl Presumptive of the Duke of Devonshire, gave Edna a 30-stone 
flawless diamond graduated necklace. And the center stone of that necklace weighed in at a whopping 17 and a half carats. The smallest stone in that necklace was uh, tip the scales at four carats in the back. Edna often wore these necklaces, one on top of the other, with her House of Worth gowns for photo shoots. Uh, glossies and, um, and uh, postcards of Edna, uh, they could not keep up with demand. Hundreds of thousands were sold, and Edna received a percentage of every one of those uh, sales. So she was not only becoming super famous, she was also uh, becoming super rich. Now, um, during the time that Edna was running in, uh, in, in uh, uh, London, Sam and his brothers were continuing to build their cadre of theaters. Soon they were managing all three theaters in Syracuse, dead theaters in Buffalo and Rochester and Albany and down the East Coast. Um, they realized, however, that um, if they really wanted to make their mark in the theater world and to become big time producers, they were going to have to establish a presence in New York City. And so around 1900, beginning in 1900, 1901, uh, they go down to New York City with uh, financial backers from their Syracuse neighborhood, and they lease the Herald Square Theater. Now, that's a 35th Street in New York. At that time, the theater district in New York City was below 35th Street. So this was the northernmost theater, and everybody thought, oh, that, that theater is too far north, and they'll never be able to make um, a success of it. But... Sam was really smart. He knew uh, from his experience in the theater here in Syracuse that um, even a mediocre show, if it had a really big star, it would sell out. That the star is the one who sold the tickets. So Sam takes off to London uh, with his good friend and uh, one of his financial backers from Syracuse, Jesse Oberdorfer, who's the heir to a local foundry. Uh, Jesse and, and uh, Sam go to, New go to London and they meet with their friend, Edna, who is uh, the toast of the town and the queen of theater. And the three of them, you can imagine, probably had a great time. Uh, but with Edna's recommendation and also a hefty check from Jesse, Sam gets the rights to the American, the U.S. national tour of the Belle of New York. Now, this is really important because uh, it puts Sam in contact with all of the theater managers and directors, the railroads, the hotels, everything that you need to put on these national tours. He takes uh, Abe Thalheimer from Syracuse, his 15th Ward uh, neighbor, who becomes his right-hand man who organizes these tours. So uh, this sets the scene for Sam to become, really the Schubert's to become the preeminent coast-to-coast uh, -coast tour producers in America, a, a role that they will play for decades to come. And uh, um, he also uh, convinces uh, Edna to um, open the new Herald Square Theater in, uh, in New York. And, um, and so she agrees. And there, thereby, he ensures that that Herald Square Theater is for sure going to be a huge hit. And in fact, it is, uh, sells out uh, the entire show. Over the next five years, 1900, 1905, the Schuberts and Edna are really helping each other. Edna is opening new theaters for the Schuberts that they're uh, uh, opening in New York. They start investing uh, even further north, investing Syracuse money in uh, uh, real estate around a little square known as Longacre Square that we know today as Times Square. And they begin to build Broadway as we know it. Edna is opening these shows from the opening theaters. They're becoming salads. They're providing great material for her to star in. And they're getting more stars and more producers in their fight against the syndicate when an unimaginable tragedy strikes. In 1905, uh, while traveling on a train to Pittsburgh to actually testify in a hearing against the syndicate over the Duquesne Theater there uh, with Al Abe Thalheimer, Sam's train collides with a work train carrying dynamite. Um, and uh, Abe Thalheimer pulls Sam from the wreckage, but it's to no avail. He dies two days later from his injuries. Um, and this is a major blow to the theater world and, of course, to Edna on a personal level as well. But Sam's brothers, Lee and JJ, uh, they win that fight over the Duquesne Theater in Pittsburgh. They they ramp up their fight against the syndicate. They continue to uh, expand their theaters and they build, um, they, they, they uh, manage and, and do all of this in their brother's memory and in his name. And they build the largest theatrical empire the world has ever known. 
The Schubert organization that they created is still by far the largest theater owner on Broadway with 17 landmark Broadway theaters. So um, uh, Edna now, by this time, uh, it's around 1906, a year later, and Edna is in Washington, D.C., starring at the National Theater in a production there. Uh, unlike most actresses, though, who are staying in hotels or boarding houses, or maybe even a suite if you're a star, Edna is the guest of President uh, Theodore and Mrs. Roosevelt staying at the White House. Uh, the name of that show was um, The Catch of the Season. And it was a particularly appropriate title because remember, once again, for the first time in years, Edna is, an, is a single woman. The suitors, as you can imagine, line up and Edna has her choice, but she chooses wisely this time. And she's soon engaged to a young man named Oscar Lewison. Now, Oscar is about six years younger than Edna. He's very handsome, Harvard educated, very charismatic, and very rich. Oscar's father was known as one of the Copper Kings who made an international fortune in that metal. He died when Oscar was only 18 years old, so Oscar inherited a good portion of his fortune. And, um, and certainly, like most young men of the time, had eyes for Edna May. Uh, uh, um, he went to Harvard uh, and basically then just managed his investments and raised racing horses and prize dogs. And he and Edna kind of bonded over their love of canines. And um, Oscar followed uh, Edna back to London, where she was starring at that time in a production called The Bell of Mayfair, obviously playing on the success of The Bell of New York. She was the star of the show, but she felt that the best song in that show was actually given to a young ingenue actress named Camille Clifford, of whom Edna was actually very, uh, very fond, liked her very much. But she felt that as the star, she should have the best song. So after a very public confrontation with the producer, she left the show. Um, it's not really known whether Edna was thinking that Wedded Bliss would be preferable to trying to maintain her uh, status as the number one superstar or whether she thought that maybe her star was beginning to fade over the issue with Camille Clifford. But at any rate, Edna decided she wanted to go out while she was at the top. So she announced that once she married um, uh, Oscar, she would retire from the theater. Oscar and Edna were married in June uh, of um, uh, 1907 in England. They went on a six month honeymoon tour of Europe where they were hosted by many crowned heads. Oscar was good friends with the Prince of Wales. And of course, Edna was uh, one of the most famous women in the world. So um, after their honeymoon, they settled in, uh, in English in, in the countryside in Windsor. They bought a large estate there called Cranbourne Court. Uh, that became famous, famous eventually, by the way, as the home of rock star Rod Stewart. Uh, and Edna settled into a life of domestic bliss, really uh, gardening and outdoor sports and house parties. They were famous for their house parties. And many of their friends, her friends from Syracuse, uh, went and stayed with them for extended stays, including uh, Mary Elizabeth Evans, the Candy Queen, uh, stayed at, uh, at Cranbourne Court with Edna and Oscar. The Prince of Wales was also known to, uh, to attend many of those parties. Uh, in 1915, uh, Oscar and Edna came to New York to escape the ravages of World War I in Europe. While they were in New York, Edna made a silent film version of The Bell of New York called Salvation Joan, and she donated all of her astronomical $100,000 salary for that movie to the Red Cross to help in the war effort. In 1917, Oscar fell ill, and he was admitted to Mount Sinai Hospital in New York, but unfortunately died from complications and surgery uh, at just 33 years old. It was a very, very happy marriage and Edna was devastated. Uh, of course, she inherited Oscar's fortune and then combined it with her own and went back to Cranbourne Court where she really lived in seclusion for a couple of years. Eventually she sold Cranbourne Court, moved into a suite of rooms at the fashionable Savoy Hotel. She eventually also became uh, romantically involved with another multimillionaire, uh, son of a multimillionaire, Howard Gould, son of Jay Gould. Uh, she actually even moved into his palatial estate uh, in England called Mungewell Park. Um, but the relationship was reportedly volatile, even though he showered her with lots of gifts, furs, and of course, jewelry. Um, 
but she eventually left him in 1929 and began to travel the world extensively. Uh, she came to Syracuse quite often to visit her friends and family. The last time she was in Syracuse was in 1935, uh, where she was honored at a, uh, a luncheon at the Hotel Syracuse that was attended by over 400 women. Again, traveled, often went to Switzerland. She became ill, went into a clinic in Lausanne, Switzerland, and, uh, and unfortunately, eventually, uh, when she was only 69 years old, died on uh, January 1st, 1948. In 1950, I think, or somewhere in 1950, her two sisters donated a portrait, an oil portrait of Edna that was painted uh, of her as Violet Gray, uh, back in the days of the Belle of New York, painted in 1907 by a very famous artist, uh, Sir Lavery. Um, and um, they donated that, pan that pa painting in Edna's memory to the uh, Syracuse Museum of Fine Arts. The last known whereabouts of that painting was in a Sotheby's auction catalog in 2011 with an estimate of between $40,000 and $60,000. Edna was, um, you know, the top star in the world. Uh, this is before um, uh, movies and, and radio and television, when theater was the thing. She was the top for 10 years. And the Schubert, uh, their legacy is, uh, is continuing, uh, not only with the organization that they created, but the foundation, the Schubert Foundation, is one of the largest of its kind in the world, funding regional theater all around the country, including our own Syracuse stage. And by the way, we ask that you uh, please uh, patronize our sister organizations in the art and cultural industry once it is safe to do so. Syracuse Stage uh, is an amazing theater company. We have a great collaboration with them where we put exhibits in the lobby for some of their shows that correspond to the theme of their shows and also let people learn uh, something interesting about local history. And we have an exhibit coming up uh, for their show once which has be re been uh, rescheduled for the fall. So keep an eye out for that. Uh, thanks for joining me for another edition of uh, OHA Bedtime Stories, and I look, to, uh, look forward to seeing you next time here. Thanks.